welcome everybody. I see that you're joining us. Um, at this is the first um, ISD ICSD speaker series on sustainable development leaders in the workforce. Um, this is the first time we're doing it, uh, really in celebration of the tenth the tenth uh, year anniversary of ICSD. So. Um, we're really happy that you're here, and we're happy um, to introduce and present the first speaker, um, who is Dr. Jolene Shoemaker from the University of California, Davis, and um, she is the Director of Global Eng Engagement at that university, but she has a really interesting background. She has her, she got her JD at Georgetown University. Um, I just learned, spent 20 years in Washington, D.C. Um, she has her master's as well in security studies from Georgetown University and her BA from political science at the University of California, San Diego. So I am sure that she will be able to just share a lot based on her experiences, her education and, and you know, on, on the future um, in terms of the workforce and what we can, you know, things to take away, what we can do in that field. So without much ado, over to um, Dr. Shoemaker. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for having me um, and uh, inviting me to this uh, this great initiative. Um, so I do have some slides that I'm going to use just to share as I'm talking. But um, we talked a little bit about um, you know maybe uh, it would be interesting. I know there there are a lot of students that are. Um, on this uh, webinar, thinking about you know their career paths and uh, interest areas, and so um, I'll just uh, spend maybe a couple of minutes just telling you a little bit more about my path because I think it's really important to realize that there are so many different entry points and uh, different um, choices that we make through our career to uh, pursue things that are meaningful for us. Um, so I, um, I did uh, graduate with my advanced degrees from Georgetown. Um, I'm um, at University of California Davis, which I'll talk about um, back in California, but I did spend um, about two decades out in Washington, D.C. Um, after I uh, graduated with my degrees from, um, from Georgetown. And um, I've kind of weaved in and out of different sectors. I uh, started out actually in government, um, working on um, diplomacy and human rights. Um, and then as everything is interconnected in the way that um, we look at um, foreign policy and national uh, security, then I um, also worked, uh, I worked both on the, uh, for the U.S. Department of State and the D Department of Defense, um, looking at various uh, issues uh, on the agenda on, on peace and security and um, human rights. Um, and then um, decided that I really wanted to work for, uh, really wanted to work in the non-governmental organization space, civil society. So I spent quite a few years uh, working on pressing uh, policymakers from the other side. So I was was in the policymaking space and then moved outside to try to push um, from the external side, um, specifically uh, for the women, peace and security agenda. Um, and so if you're interested in uh, gender equality, the gender equality aspects of peace and security, I, I recommend that you look into that agenda that's been gaining a lot of momentum. Um, in the past uh, 20 years. Um, so I was privileged to work with a lot of uh, a lot of other activists and advocates um, and um, policymakers as well to, to move that forward. Um, and now I'm back in California and I'm really excited uh, with what I'm able to uh, work on with colleagues at um, University of California Davis, um, specifically focused on how we're engaging with uh, sustainable development goals. Um, so I will uh, square, share screen um, and uh, have a, uh, some slides to share, which I hope is helpful as I kind of talk through some of the things that the organizers of this session were interested and in, thought that um, you would all be interested in um, hearing about, hearing a little bit more about. Um, so, oh, and my 
Sorry, screen share. I have this happen periodically. There we go. Um, hopefully everyone can see it. So I thought it would be interesting for you all. Um, probably many of you are affiliated right now with universities um, completing degrees. Um, but it would be interesting for you all to know something about the uh, higher education landscape and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so really the UN Sustainable Development Goals, as many of you probably already know, um, was agreed to, uh, was an agenda that was agreed to by all nations in the world in 2015. Um, and it's a very ambitious agenda um, uh, that is um, really gaining so much momentum um, around the world at every level and in every sector in terms of being a really important framework um, for us to collaborate. Um, so the universities around the world have been um, increasingly interested in as well um, in how to effectively engage with this agenda. Um, and this agenda really does challenge universities to think differently about not only their strategies, um, their global engagement, how they're structured, um, but also just how they do the work of research and teaching and um, service and their own operations on campus um, and really trying to be more transformative um, and give students the opportunities that are really needed to prepare for the world that we live in and the challenges that we face. Um, so uh, there's also a really interesting uh, SDSN, as uh, as you all know, uh, is uh, you know featured here as a as a co-host um, to this session, and um, th there are emerging global networks uh, such as the SDSN, which I highly recommend. Uh, I've been privileged to be a part of part of this network um, for the last couple of years and, and actively involved. Um, but these international networks are really important to get involved with, um, especially now as we are kind of in a hybrid situation with um, not always in person and often virtual. It's really important to be a part of networks where you can connect with people um, in different ways and not just through traveling to conferences and so forth. Um, and um, also within the, the university space, there's just uh, one of the challenges, I think, but it's also an opportunity, is that there's very there are very few models about how to incorporate global goals, um, the SDGs, um, these frameworks. Um, and because there's very few models, uh, many universities are kind of in this very open or creative space thinking about what they could do differently, um, how they can better support what the students need. Um, so it's a really exciting time actually on the you know in the university sector and it's a time when I think students have a lot of influence and voice um, in terms of how they would like to see um, universities um, being very active and being very out front and um, sharing knowledge and giving those opportunities for leadership development so it's a really important time right now to be engaged um, so uh, you all probably know something about the UN Sustainable Development Goals, or you wouldn't be at this conference, but um, but it is really, I have a couple of important things that I always talk about or that are striking to me as really special, important about the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So we know, we've seen many times the 17 boxes. We, we, we've we become very familiar with seeing this in a variety of contexts. And these are really important. The boxes are a great visual for us to just be reminded of the topics that are encompassed in this agenda um, and to be able to link our own work very clearly to uh, one or more, usually more, um, because they are so interlinked um, SDGs. So it is a really important visual, um, but it is also important to realize what's behind that, that um, in 2015, when all the United Nations member states agreed to the sustainable development goals, that that is a really powerful statement in itself. It's very difficult to get international consensus um, and to get international consensus on something um, this ambitious with um, this many topics and um, and uh, and goals is, is really quite powerful. And we can use it um, to advocate for, for the change that we would like to see um, in an effective way. Um, and I think it's also just really important that they're intersectional and indivisible. And this is this is uh, 
really important in the university context, but it's also important as you all are uh, working within your disciplines and um, working um, more closely in your expertise areas um, to work across. Um, that hasn't always been the case. Um, and I think that um, it, these complex issues, there's just really no other way to solve them. So we have to figure out ways to come together across um, our expertise and discipline areas and to really think how these things are interlinked and how one decision on one thing can have multiple impacts across. Um, of course, the SDGs covered three dimensions of development. So we need to understand it's not just environmental, environmental is key, but so is social and economic um, so that they fit together. Um, and having that kind of holistic thinking is really gonna be important for the future. Um, and then this is the piece I always tell people um, and students to, to if you're interested in working with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, um, don't just look at the boxes, don't just look at the targets and indicators, actually read the resolution from 2015, or at least the first few pages of it, because it will tell you what the principles, uh, what the goals are centered on, and that they're centered on three principles, really. Leave no one behind, meaning that we can't make decisions that are going to leave populations and communities behind, um, that human rights and gender equality are really central. So making sure that we're centering our work um, on, on those principles, I think is really important. And again, it doesn't always happen because oftentimes when we're focused on a certain issue set, um, that expertise um, necessarily that, or that discipline has not been as steeped in some of the tools, analytical tools around human rights and gender equality. So I'm, I'm here at University of California, Davis. Um, we're a comprehensive tier one research university. Um, and you can see from the map on the left, if you don't know where UC Davis is, it's sort of to, to the, near the top of uh, Northern California, um, sort of in the middle. Um, and you can see that we're part of the University of California system. So you can see from that map, the other campuses, and you may be familiar with some of these other places as well. Um, so over the past few years, I've had the privilege of coordinating um, our work um, on global engagement and the SDGs. And we've really um, started to focus as a, as a university and in, in, in our global affairs office um, and our other offices um, on the SDGs for several reasons. Um, it really, uh, this agenda aligns with our strategic priorities as a university, our many areas of strength that we have. Um, our history, but also our priorities on um, interdisciplinary approaches. So looking at issues in an interdisciplinary manner is really important to the university. And it's really, this is an agenda that helps us really do strengthen that. Um, and then we have a mission to improve the lives of individuals, families, and communities around the campus because we are a land grant university um, in the United States. So that's a really important part of our identity and our mission and the SDGs directly connect with that. Um, and we found that it's really important to start bridging local and global concerns. So in um, my career path, um, when uh, historically, uh, at least in the United States, if you worked on foreign policy or you worked on international affairs, uh, global issues, uh, you weren't working on domestic uh, United States or local issues in the United States. It was very separate, right, as career paths and um, as focus areas. Is. And I think we're starting to understand that these problems are very common. Um, we may have our own, we do have our own, our own unique context where we live and work um, and what we're experiencing in our communities, but there's so much that we're, sh that we actually share um, in terms of the challenges. And so uh, we found this to be just tremendous potential to bridge those concerns. And when we bridge, we come up with very innovative and interesting solutions. So it's a great area to be in um, if you can, um, if you can uh, be part of br that bridging. 
um, just a little bit in case you're interested of, of, uh, of how we've kind of approached it, because the reason I mentioned the strategy at UC Davis is just that this has been a couple, a few years, of, at least a large portion of my professional life has been really focused on how do we engage more in this agenda um, in the university campus. And, and I've been spending a lot of my time thinking about it with, and collaborating with others on our campus and worldwide to listen and hear and share. So um, I've been with others around campus working um, a lot on raising awareness and finding ways for, for students and faculty and, and others to get involved. Um, certainly supporting the next generation so that we've been building a lot for students um, and trying to hear what students are interested in what's resonating with them about the uh, problems that they're seeing around the world. Um, and then collaborating really closely with partners and networks around the world. Collaboration is really um, central to solving these problems, but professionally, as you all look out to your careers, it's one of those things that is a skill set that, that is really important to build collaboration skill sets and partnership skill sets. It's not easy to do effective collaborations and partnerships. It takes a lot of work um, and it takes a lot of um, other skills like listening and, um, you know, and compromising and, um, you know, being aware of a different where people, different people sit and what they're concerned about. Um, and then tracking our progress. So we started this, um, I'll tell you a little bit about a, a huge project that I worked on, but we started this recently with how can we track our progress um, at UC Davis. So that's a little bit about what I've been working on. Um, and here's just a couple of examples. I bring them up because professionally, I think it's really important to take on opportunities to do something new um, when you can that hasn't been done before. It can be really intimidating. Um, it can be a little bit scary. We're all afraid of, of the risk of failure, but um, this is the only way we, we push ourselves and we push our institutions to think differently um, um, and to do things in a more transformative way um, as the SDGs are, are intended to be. Um, if the way we were all doing things worked, we wouldn't need the SDGs. We wouldn't have these systemic problems that are going on in the world. The way that things are being done, business as usual is not working. So we really need to challenge ourselves. And that part of that is challenging ourselves individually, professionally, to do things that are a little bit outside of our comfort zone and that we haven't done before. Um, so the Voluntary University Review was an example of this. Um, UC Davis, uh, we decided to, uh, uh, several different units and our leadership decided uh, that we uh, should embark on a university review of how we're doing on the SDGs and what we're doing on the SDGs. And this was really a huge project over a year long um, we were one of the first in the world and the second in the U.S. to do one. So like I was saying before, a lot of these uh, initiatives, they don't have any models. Um, so you you kind of have to figure out along the way, which makes it really actually a very creative space um, and interesting, intellectually challenging space. Um, so a lot of this was, again, how do how do you partner um, in different ways. Um, so universities have, you know, have silos, they have different offices that are responsible for different things. And that's a problem when we need to work together oftentimes. So we were really crossing with uh, colleagues on campus to bring together expertise. Um, and our office worked with our sustainability office um, and our diversity, equity, and inclusion office really closely. The three of uh, three offices, we worked on this collaboratively. Um, and we used a variety of tools. We had to really come up with our own methodology, what, what could work for UC Davis, what would make sense, what would be meaningful information. Um, and part of that was surveying and part of it was finding data around campus and analyzing that uh, other data that's collected. So like I said, no precedent for a lot of these kinds of initiatives, um, which really um, uh, forces, uh, forces people into creative problem solving. And it's a really important professional skill in this, in this field. Um, and this is just another a, a set of examples. Um, we've been 
we've been very uh, committed and passionate. This is what universities are supposed, this is what we're set up to do, right? Uh, to, to support the next generation in knowledge, um, in gaining knowledge and, and being prepared to go out into the world and uh, really address these complex challenges. So we're trying to figure out ways to support that for students. So these are just some examples of the things that 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 uh, we're building. Uh, we've been building at UC Davis an internship, um, a summer course, um, and then we do a lot to support uh, global learning. Um, and we're put we're infusing the uh, sustainable development goals into a lot of that. And these experiences are really meant to introduce to these um, to these uh, to this global uh, framework and other global frameworks that are out there um, and help 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 young people students to to engage with those um, to have a voice um, to think about um, uh, unpacking or understanding really complex issues how do we how do we it, it can be very difficult to, um, to understand all these dimensions of these really complex issues. So how do we start doing that? How, what tools are there? Um, how do we use analysis? Um, and then helping us really uh, move forward on projects that are brand new for UC Davis around the sustainable development goals and supporting that agenda. So these are some of the reasons that I think it's really useful to use the SDGs as a framework um, and that we found it to be really useful, but that I found it to be really useful professionally as well. Um, I think that it is a great tool for understanding in a more holistic well, way really complex issues because it is quite hard to unpack these and um, it gives us a way to do that um, to start thinking about how they're interrelated and how one decision could negatively or positively impact um, different communities um, to think about all of our stakeholders and how they're important. Important. It's important to have input and voice and think about how they could be um, impacted. Um, that the agenda really values multiple perspectives and expertise areas and experiences. So we want to really find ways to bring together different lenses and perspectives and you all on the on the webinar, I'm sure represent a really diverse set of uh, of um, programs that you're in and expertise areas that you're building um, for your own career. And it's very powerful to bring these together. Um, and um, we aren't always structured in ways to do that. So I think that this agenda is really important. And it's really important as students to find ways to work on projects with others who are not coming from your same backgrounds and are not coming from your same discipline areas because we are all trained with different types of tools, analytical tools and ways of working and approaches and um, we can learn from each other and really bring those together. So it is very, not only personally rewarding to work with people from all different backgrounds um, and um, with different lenses that they bring to the issues, but it also is really beneficial to any organization that you're working in and any project. Um, really importantly, as I've said, I we come back to stakeholders. So I've spent a lot of my professional career working on advocating for the women, peace and security agenda, which is really about women um, being on the front lines of peace movements around the world, but being sidelined. Um, and left behind when it comes to peace agreements, when it comes to uh, making decisions about governance after conflict or in the midst of instability. And what I've learned is just you cannot have anything sustainable um, by leaving people behind and by not including stakeholders. And Traditionally, a lot of times when we think about stakeholders, when organizations think about stakeholders, they tend to think about the most powerful stakeholders, stakeholders that have a lot of influence and that can spoil things, spoilers as we call them. And that's obviously an important realistic thing to do, but it often does minimize 
um, groups of stakeholders that may not have as much influence. And that's a problem in a lot of ways. So this really uh, agenda really challenges us to think differently and to think about all stakeholders and valuing all of those kinds of perspectives that and making sure they come to the table. And then, of course, facilitates linkages and collaboration. So a big part of what I've been what I've done for my 25, 25 year career is collaborations and um, building things um, with building projects and building ways to work with others. And um, this is really important. And if we have a common framework like the SDGs, it makes it a lot easier um, to, uh, to start those collaborations, to figure out where um, we have the same interests and where we have the same commitments and where we want to, what we want to pursue and explore between organizations and between people. Um, so it's a really important starting point that we don't always have. Um, so uh, the organizers for this session also mentioned that um, it might be interesting for you all to just hear a couple of thoughts about future needs um, sort of in the career, the larger career field. Um, uh, and in my case, I guess that would be so SDGs, uh, global engagement, uh, uh, advocacy, <laughs> policy making, kind of a, a, a mix and higher education, a mix of a mix of different fields. But um, these are three things that I've been thinking a lot about as we're working on the on pushing forward um, new types of ways of doing things um, using the SDGs, um, where I think they're only growing areas. Um, if you can gain some experience um, and, and um, think about them as important angles to your work. Um, so the first is data collection and expertise. So as we all know, no matter matter what our discipline is, um, there are just there's so much data out there um, and organizations are really struggling with how to collect data um, and how to use data to inform decision making. And every organization is struggling with this from the smallest civil society organizations to big governments, large governments, multi multinational um, organizations like the United Nations and others. It's just there's there the data issue is becoming more and more complex. Um, and at the same time, we're recognizing that we have gaps, um, huge gaps in our data. I mean, one example is we're just not collecting appropriate levels of data that would show us what's going on with inequalities, um, gender inequalities and other inequalities, racial other inequalities. Um, we already know that. Um, and the data gaps show us that it's actually just not that important to organizations. Um, they show us what's important and what's not. So we really need to challenge organizations um, to gather the data where there is gaps and to be more intentional about it because we can't fix what we don't see. Um, and if we don't have the data and the data is not presented on inequalities, then it's very easy to turn a blind eye and to not think that these things are problems or as big problems as they are and urgently need to be addressed. So dealing with data, not only being able to be comfortable with data and look at data and be able to analyze it from a technical point of view, but really be able to use your analytical skills to say, this is missing. Why isn't this here? Why aren't we, are we collecting this and analyzing it in the best way will be really important. And then of course, emerging technology, because everyone's talking about AI, everyone's talking about data sets being really problematic right now with, with technology and in, and biases then coming out of the technology. So this is these are all areas that if you're interested in data, if you're interested in how we're informing decision making, um, this is an area that is, it will be really um, important to explore and to have more young people have expertise and be looking at it more holistically. Um, the second is bridging academics, policymakers, and practitioners. So. This is still a big problem. Um, we're still living in our silos. It's easier to be, if we're policymakers, to talk to other policymakers. If we're practitioners, to talk to other practitioners. If we're academics, to partner with other academics. It's a comfort zone. 
So we need to push ourselves out of this. We need to start bridging um, these sectors and um, and start being able to um, to to speak a language that's understandable across. And that's where the SDGs, I think, can be really helpful, um, as well as other techniques to really start bridging what we need to do across and leveraging the individual strengths that these different sectors have. And then third, changing institutions. So institutions just need deep structural change um, to deal with the world of the world's problems right now they're not necessarily set up um, to, to appropriately address these complex and interconnected challenges so we need young people uh, coming into these institutions to point this out and to say okay why don't we ch make change here or why don't it very slow um, it's very slow to do institutional change, but it needs to happen because if our institutions are not structured in a way to appropriately do this, then um, we're going to often um, be pushing things to the margins that shouldn't be pushed to the margins. And we're also going to just have problems making transformational change because everything will be so incremental and we don't have time with these problems um, that are just incredibly urgent. Um, so we need champions both inside institutions to push those institutions incrementally. And then we need champions outside of institutions to say, this needs to change. Here's the expertise that needs to come in. Here's the knowledge that needs to come in. So those are a couple of things that I thought might be helpful. And then the important skills, just to just to um, emphasize some important skills that I've uh, found in my career and that I found in working with the SDGs um, that are really just vitally important. And they sound, some of them sound very simple, um, but ask questions and always be curious. That can sound really simple, but um, actually asking questions in um, situations where you may be the only one asking a certain question is hard and it takes courage. Um, and so it is a challenge that um, it needs to happen because the only time that you know, organizations start changing their approaches or see something that they didn't see before was because someone at the table had the courage to ask a question that might have not been ever asked by anyone else. So. Don't ever underestimate the power of asking questions and how it can change the conversation in really beneficial ways. Um, the persuasion ability. So you have to be able to make your point very clearly and understand what your what you want your audience to do with that information and um and that's a persuasion it's not just um it's persuasion it's using facts and using data to say okay this needs to change this is the problem here is some knowledge that we have or i have to Put on the table that could that could be beneficial for that but the change needs to happen so um, messaging um, taking risks and using creativity like i said before really important um, to be able to take risks and all the things that you know the example some of the examples i gave um that there had been no precedent there's no model um it, it sometimes it might not work but a lot of times it works and it's really valuable not only for your organization but for the larger field to learn from um, and take forward and improve on um, as we're going forward um, and then communication obviously you've heard it i'm sure a million times from every mentor you've had um, but communication just is so important and um, both written and verbal. And then I would say uh, learn different ways of uh, different analysis uh, um, tools. Um, so I work a lot with gender analysis tools, which are intersectional. So when you use gender analysis tools, you actually uncover a lot of other um, it's information about inequalities um, that's intersectional. So it's been really useful in my work. It's very valuable. Um, uh, systems thinking as well, you may have heard of. I'm a big fan of systems thinking because I think it's a really important way to see interconnections and to see root causes of things um, as well. So those are two of them that I've worked with, but I think that there are many other valuable um, tools out there. But just really trying to educate yourself on using some of these analytical tools to uncover um, things that might not be seen otherwise and to really um, start understanding in a deeper level um, some of the problems that are going on. And then, of course, I've said it, 
um, before in this presentation, but just really trying to find ways to gain experience working collaboratively on projects and working with people from different backgrounds. And this is both virtual and in person. It used to have to happen in person, um, but now increasingly it's happening virtually and that's challenging in its own ways. So sometimes just being gaining experience virtually and in person will be really useful because it will make you very adaptable to whatever situation is going on in the workforce. Um, so that's it for my just what I thought might be helpful to all of you to think about. And I'm happy to um, be here for Q&A and um, any discussion areas or interest areas that you had that I didn't cover or that you wanted a little bit more information on. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shoemaker. Um, we do have um, some questions. Please keep them um, coming in. Uh, but before we go to those questions, I just I'm curious to know, working at a university, an academic institution um, in the US specifically, do you find pushback on your SDG or on the SDG agenda, um, probably from, you know, it is a university, it, you know, students will come in, these are, you know, they, it'll be something that they need to learn about, but thinking about the political atmosphere of this country specifically, you know, what, is it, is it that easy, really? Yeah, I mean, I think that it is, um, it, it's challenging, not because there's over, there's not so much over resistance, I think it's more that um, the first thing, the first obstacle is really awareness. A lot of times um, there's pockets of knowledge about the SDGs, but especially because the United States uh, as a country has not been terribly engaged with the SDGs for uh, um, a number of years. I think that's that's changing, that's shifting now, um, uh, uh, fortunately, but um, that, you know, a, a lot of um, students and faculty just are unaware of the, of and staff are just unaware. They don't know what the SDGs are. They've never heard of it. Um, uh, in our collaborations with universities from other countries, it feels like internationally, it's a lot, it's a lot more known. Um, and um, so I think that the first hurdle oftentimes is just pure, what is this? And, and, and talking about how it can be used and how, how it relates to an individual's work and how it can be used beneficially. And one of the first things we did um, was uh, we did we did several we did some surveying over the past few years, but we started by surveying our faculty to understand the faculty that were, you know, identifying as working on this. And that was very revealing um, because a lot of the faculty actually not only identified that they were working on the SDGs, they saw the connection and the value, but also that they were working on the SDGs in the United States, not just not just with collaborators in other countries. And so that was really illuminating because that told us that people do when they learn about the agenda, they do see that it resonates even within work that would not be classified as international work. Um, so that awareness raising is really important. And then I think the second hurdle is you're gonna always have pockets of people who say, this doesn't relate to my work. I don't see the value. And as, you know, as I said, I've been working for quite a few years on advocating for an agenda uh, with institutions, with the United States government, with the UN, um, and come, we always come across resistance, like resistance from people who just don't see it, things as a priority the same way. Um, and so rather than really trying to spend a lot of energy convincing them, I think you show. And, um, and I think you focus on where your champions are and, and support your champions to do the really impactful work. And then it shows others over time how valuable it really is. Um, and so that's kind of been, been our approach. And then institutionally, like I said, it's not overt resistance, but institutions are always resistant. 
it's just the nature of institutions and bureaucracy. Um, people, you know, institutions, they have their mission, they have their strategic plans, they have their, they have people who have defined roles and generally people don't want things added. Um, we were just having a discussion at UC Davis with some international, some scholars from other countries yesterday, one who works for a development bank and saying, you know, people just say, I don't want to report on something else. I don't want to report on the SDG. So a lot of it is workload. You know, there's different things. So it is slow. It can be slow. But I do think one of the other things we're working on is really trying to embed it in the university strategies. Because once you embed it in the strategies, people do have to report, um, you know, on how they're making progress on those strategies. So that's an important tool as well. But it is a, a process. It's a learning process for all of us. Okay, thank you. And we have um, a question here from uh, Kennedy, let me see, um, well, Kennedy, and it reads, I realize that many people, including professionals, are still not aware of the SDG goals and targets. Are there strategies in place to enable individuals adopt, personalize, and act on the targets at the individual level? Um, my assumption is that every, that, um, that is, that is that it requires everyone's contribution for the targets to be achieved at a truly global scale. So I guess you can take this to your campus um, and you talked about it, but I think they would like to hear a little bit more. Absolutely. I think that it, it's a great question because I think that it can be hard to find the entry points for an individual. Um, and the target, so if you all look at the uh, global indicator framework, which is part of the agenda, but it was uh, it was agreed to a couple years after the SDGs. Um, it's the targets and indicators that Kennedy is referring to, um, and part of the problem is the targets and indicators are really um, geared towards governments, and. Um, and so uh, as the SDG, uh, as this agenda, the 2030 agenda has gained momentum and not only universities, but local cities and, and, and so forth have seen that they could use it and it's valuable and it resonates with the problems they're facing. The targets and indicators, there's a misalignment in some ways with the targets and indicators and where that data would be and who collects that data and what types of data that is with the data that would be really relevant at the more local or university levels. So it's hard sometimes because when you look at the, if you look at the targets and indicators, you may get the sense, what could I possibly do? These are huge targets um, and metrics. Um, and um, so I, 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 we actually in our class, we talk about the targets and indicators and some of the problems with that, but I have instead we focus more on the goals themselves and the interconnections and what you can do in your, even in your own community. So with students, we're also talking about you know, become involved in the global discussions and dialogues. And there's ways to do that. There's entry points like SDSN, right? There's there's networks that you can be a part of and there's emerging through these networks, all kinds of student pro programs and projects. And those projects are case studies. If you participate in those projects as a student, as an undergrad or grad student, those projects are case studies in how to do the SDGs. So you're actually directly participating in, in um, building, the, building the knowledge base of how we implement the SDGs when you're doing those projects. So that is one way to do it. Um, but definitely your community and campus, we've also found there's tremendous opportunity to say, this is a problem we're talking about, whether it's hunger, right? That hunger or homelessness or, um, or you know, climate, what you know, we're experiencing a, a big heat wave here in California. I mean, all these issues, wildfires, whatever it is that you're seeing around you that's concerning, to bring in the SDGs into that discussion, to connect it, 
connect it globally. Um, that's a huge, uh, that's a huge, uh, that's a valuable thing that you can be doing in your own efforts um, as a student, but to just bring it into the conversation. Um, that moves us forward because that starts connecting what people are talking about in their own communities with the global challenges and it, it, it makes us understand we are connected and we've got to learn from each other. So I don't know if that's helpful, Kennedy, but I think that there are, you know, these are kind of some of the things. And we're, we're actually, um, to your point too, we, we felt that students were struggling with how they could connect and, and, and be part of this agenda. So we actually, uh, our, our SDG interns, our group of undergraduates put together a student guide to the SDGs for UC Davis that we're gonna, um, we're gonna promote in the fall, it's almost done. So we hope that's a help just to give students an idea of where they can intersect with this agenda. Thank you so much, Dr. Shoemaker. There's another question, um, and I'm I'm picking the questions based on the number of thumbs up. So the, this one has two, <laughs> and this is from Midhat Kiani, and and uh, and they say relevant. Well, they say, what do you see the future of Agenda 2030, particularly when it comes to education for SDG? Uh, SDGs replace MDGs. What will replace SDGs? And this is really where I think you can really add, um, how can universities take this into account? Yeah, so, um, so you know, to, the, to your question before about where there's resistance or uh, this is the area where there is the most resistance, to be honest, because institutional change, um, you know, is slow and it's long-term thinking and um, and as a result, sometimes what you hear from people is this agenda is going to go away anyway. Um, it has a time limit, 2030. So why should we change things or put it in, articulate it in our strategies or shift the way that we're doing things if it's going to go away? So this is actually the area where you hear the most vocal resistance um to institutional change um it's not of course a question that i have the answer to you know what what happens after 2030 but i do think that um my perspective at least and i mean it's completely my perspective is that because the sdgs it was a very extensive consultative process around the world to come up with the sdgs uh, i'm well, pretty impressive about three years more than three years of uh, consultations with all different sectors um and so they they really do represent the voice of the world on what the what the concerns are I don't see that they that they will change that much. I, I think they've been heavily, you know, brought in from input and and negotiated um, by the member states. Um, I I think there were problems with the MDGs. You know, there weren't very many of them. Um, some of them were very spe more specific, um, and so I think they addressed some of those problems with the 2030 agenda. Um, the targets and indicators, I think, will need an overhaul. That's that's my that because as the SDGs have localized so much, I think that they're gonna the implementation structures will probably need the overhaul. Um, the voluntary national they have voluntary national reviews. Many governments have submitted. Um, it's completely voluntary. Um, and voluntary local reviews are rising. I think there'll be more acknowledgement of those different levels of how we're tracking progress. Um, and then a relook at like what the data looks like and how we can measure progress at different levels. That I could foresee happening, but probably this, the, the, the philosophy behind the SDGs, like I was saying, those, those things that make it special, um, plus the 17 goals themselves, I just, I, they're not going away. We're not going to achieve them by 2030. We already know that um, with COVID-19 and all the, you know, the, the, it set us backwards in so many ways. Um, and these system, systemic problems are very difficult to achieve, but I think, um, I think we have to keep going on it. And so hopefully, you know, it will, extend uh, in in whatever manner 
you know, it does, but, but I do think it's, it's, these issues aren't going away. So that's what I tell people, regardless of how it's packaged <laughs> are agreed to by the countries. Um, these are the issues that are uh, of concern to the world. And so we need to keep moving forward on them. Okay, thank you. Um, here's another question, uh, which is focused on developing countries, but I think, you know, it, it's, it could be true for develop and developing countries. So what are your recommendations where students are uh, where students at undergraduate level from developing countries can contribute to working towards SDGs. And this is more the individual initiative. I mean, you've answered that really, but do you want to add anything else? Yes, definitely. I'm sorry for the delay. I, I was having the other phone was ringing and so I'm trying to wait till it wait till it stops for a second without trying to unplug it here. Um, okay, this should be the last one. Um, yes, yeah, so I think, well, I think one of the ways is really to, I think we have tremendous opportunities to forge cross uh, cross country, cross um, institutional projects between students. And I think it's very valuable to students to do these kinds of projects. Like I said, the networks um, that have emerged are, are starting to launch certain opportunities for students to work um, with other students from other universities. Um, and that could be a method to for students to come together across countries that are at different levels of, of their own economic development um, and bring together those um, perspectives that are going to be really important across. So that I think definitely looking at um, looking for those kinds of programs where you can do collaborative work um, would be a really important strategy and way for uh, for students at the undergraduate level from developing countries to contribute towards the SDGs. And then I would also say so that's kind of the student learning side that I think is um, there's a lot of thinking emerging right now in the university sector about how um, collaborations among universities aren't just for research. They should be for giving those kinds of opportunities for global, global work across. But the other way that you can get involved, and this is for everyone, not just certain countries. I mean, the, the wonderful thing about the SDGs is it applies equally to whatever country you're in and whatever context you're in. Um, but one of the other things that students could do is really press their uh, uh, local levels for voluntary local reviews. Um, uh, there are also often ways at the national level to get involved in the voluntary national reviews or there's input that is often being sought by um, to, to put those together. But the voluntary local reviews can be a lot more accessible um, for students. Um, if your university is located in a, in a city or an area that might be uh, willing to, uh, to engage in that, that's a great opportunity for collaboration at the local level. And then I would say also push your universities. Push your universities to integrate the SDGs as a priority. Push your universities to integrate it into the teaching and the classes and to offer projects and ways to to really dig in and um, work with the SDGs um, and push your universities to start tracking their progress. Um, there's different ways of doing that, um, you know, and um, the, 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 the process we went through was quite in, in, you know, intense and took a lot of um, time and effort, um, but, there, but universities can also track what pieces of it or, you know, you know, you don't have to always take the giant step if the university is, uh, doesn't have the capacity at that time to do it. But I think just bringing together the information and start collecting it and looking at what, what's being done. Um, like I said, we don't, we can't act on things that we don't see. We have to see the information in order to, to do something. So those might be a couple of ideas to engage. 
thank you so much. I um, We don't have a lot of time, but I will ask one last question. And that is, um, Dr. Shoemaker, I've, I've been reading and hearing a lot about academic institutions. So this is my question. Academic institutions that are creating um, their degree programs on specifically the SDGs. As an academician, do you think that that's the way to go? So for me, um, I've seen them as sort of, you know, SDG in a box or in a graduate degree program. And I guess they'll spend a year or two learning about the SDGs and probably working on some project that's related to the SDGs. Is that the way to go? I mean, multiple ways, the better, the more, the better. I, I, I see that, but I, I, I just have questions and maybe a little bit of concerns. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's interesting. I probably share some of the same perspectives you do on it. Um, I think that, you know, like you said, more, you know, more awareness, more working with uh, with this agenda is really useful. But at the same time, um, I think on any of these things, we need to be pushing for mainstreaming. Um, if we continue to silo um, the SDGs, it's just it it doesn't lend itself to siloing um and do we really want only a small cohort of students to come out and be familiar with how to work with the sdgs um that you know and how to work on global challenges more broadly um with different tools um do we really only want students that chose that degree program to be well versed and competent in working um, working with this framework um, and using this as a as a as a tool for collaboration. Um, again, that that's great, that training, that preparation that that is occurring, but I would like to see a lot more push into, you know, a variety of degree programs and disciplines. So on one one side, pushing it into that so that whatever degree we're uh, teaching or students are pursuing, there's a recognition that we're going to be globally engaged with that topic and that that topic is also intersecting with many other topics and that it has a role to play in societal challenges. And so if we can infuse some of that across and inside disciplines, but at the same time, not just infusing it in those disciplines, but really creating new spaces and ways for disciplines to work together. And I think young people will push that frontier a lot more because, you know, when we're when we're more seasoned professionals, we tend to become comfortable in the way that we've done things, right? So um, you know, there's always going to be wonderful faculty champions who are really thinking about how they could do things differently. But there's also it's going to be harder to to really think in a really innovative way more more broadly across the university and system about how we can shape the learning in different ways so that we're working across those disciplines. And I think that's an area where students themselves from where they sit are going to have a lot of valuable ideas about how that could be done more effectively. So I think at the same time, what I'd like to see is infusion, much more infusion into the disciplines, and then more thinking structurally about how we work across the disciplines on the SDGs. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Shoemaker. Really very interesting. Um, I've provided the participants your um, work email. So you'll probably get some follow-up emails. Um, and, and, and the participants, thank you for being such a good you know, our audience. Um, we're now going to move to the next speaker. We have Aniket Shaw, uh, actually Dr. Shaw as well. <laughs> He's the Managing Director and Global Head of Environmental, Social and Governance and Sustainability uh, Research at Jeffries Group. Um, he's a graduate of Yale College and University of Oxford. Um, I will, Anika will share his experiences. It's going to be um, really free flowing in the sense that he, you know, he has he has years of experience and lots of knowledge. So let me step back and let me allow um, Anika to really give you more on his background and his experiences. Thank you. Lucia, th thank you so much. Really great to be with you again and
for folks on the line, you all know, I'm sure how lucky you are to uh, have worked with Lucia and to be under her tutelage in, in some regards. Um, and it's great to be here with the SDSN, uh, an organization that I've been engaged with for the past eight years and uh, whose board I sit on now. Um, so I'm Monica, I uh, am based here in New York City and I've spent the last uh, 13 years of my career trying to navigate and crisscross the financial industry and the sustainability industry um, and with the goal of trying to get both uh, entities or both communities to speak each other's language a little bit more. Uh, when I started working on that project in 2009 um, at the Earth Institute um, at Columbia, uh, there was deep um, antipathy from um, each community towards the other. The financial industry thought the sustainability world was a bunch of tree huggers and the sustainability world thought that the financial world was a bunch of uh, you know, rapacious capitalists. Um, and now, 13 years later, everything has changed. There is a real genuine uh, desire to, for both communities to work together to try to solve problems um, around climate change, biodiversity, diver uh, social inclusion, um, uh, fair wages, and so on and so forth. And um, folks like myself are trying to figure out a path um, to do so. The, my career had sort of makes sense in retrospect, but while I was down, down this path, it didn't make much sense. Um, I spent um, around half of my career working um, at Columbia's Earth Institute and then at the, UN, at the SDSN from 14 to 17. And then I spent the other half of my career working in the financial industry, uh, first in London at a firm called Investec Asset Management a $200 billion asset manager really focused on emerging markets and sustainable investing. Um, and then some time at Oppenheimer Funds uh, before joining Jefferies, which is one of the world's largest investment banks and works to connect investors and corporates um, on the sustainability topic, which is what I do, but in general works to connect investors and corporates with capital, with in advice, with um, perspectives on where uh, money and transactions should happen um, in order to prepare for the future. In terms of um, where the world is today and the way I see it, um, you know, the, the skill sets that you all are developing or have developed over the past few years are really the skill sets that are in need across the business world. Uh, I have never seen so much demand for a certain skill set. It might be sort of rivaled with the um, need for computer scientists and engineers. Um, there's just such a desire to hire people who have knowledge around sustainability, knowledge around climate, uh, knowledge around um, you know, all of those related topics. Um, but of course, it's not just having broad knowledge, but it's about having specific knowledge. Um, I think we're at a period now where the world generally understands that sustainability is important, that climate change is a major, major long-term risk and a major long-term opportunity if we can solve some of these underlying problems. And the skill sets that are now required are people who can go into a financial model and model out how climate change will impact an investment, people who have specific knowledge around energy systems so they can work to decarbonize the energy system, um, people who understand how um, agricultural systems work so that they can be part of thinking through how to make agriculture more climate resilient and so on and so forth. So there's a real need to go from macro to micro to specific knowledge about specific sectors and in specific regions. And I think the MDP program has given people a lot of the, the toolkit in order to get to that basic, um, get, get down to that specific set of knowledge. Um, so I'm, I'll just, I'm gonna pause there um, and would love to take any you know, questions from 
the audience and from the participants. Questions from Lucia. Um, I'm, uh, Jolyn, I'm sorry I missed your uh, remarks earlier, but would love to hear any um, comments and questions that you have. Um, again, my job today is, is I sit right in the middle of the financial industry talking to both corporates and investors on sustainability. So happy to um, provide any perspectives there that might be of interest. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Aniket, I have a question. I have, um, in terms of the audience members, there yeah. is an array of students, you know, some, you know, they're focused on environment, conservation. Uh, they may not necessarily have a business background. Um, but they may be interested and probably are interested in what you are doing, what you're saying. So what would be your suggestion beyond go back to school and get an MBA? Or would that yeah. be your <laughs> recommendation yeah. to those students? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good point. Um, I would say a few things. Number one is it's good that you're interested in understanding the business and financial world. And the, in, oftentimes when I give talks like this, people have a very uh, strong antipathy towards um, business and to finance. And they think that, you know, I don't want to engage with that world because they're a bunch of crooks and blah, 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 blah. So the first thing is to be open-minded. Um, business is not all good. Business is not all bad. Finance is not all good. Finance is not all bad. Just like academia is not all good or not all bad. And, and so ha being open-minded about having a career in business or certainly understanding the business world is a, is, a, is a good place to start. So that's number one. Um, number two is in terms of how you can make your, how you can get involved. You don't need an MBA. In fact, I guess what I'm saying is that, um, um, what I'm saying is actually that the number one skill set that people are looking for is sustainability. They will actually want your underlying knowledge around sustainable development, around the SDGs, around the Paris Climate Agreement, around the nationally determined contributions, around um, you know national frameworks, around climate mitigation and adaptation. All the skills and knowledge that you should have developed in your master's program that I hope you have you know, kept up with and deepened um, over the last um, over the last several years. That's all very, very useful. Um, what the business world will want you to the, the leap you need to make is you have to figure out how you can make that knowledge useful and practical to them. You know, pragmatism is the most important um, sort of trait of being useful in the business world. People don't want long reports of 50 pages about every single detail around X, Y, and Z. What they wanna know is specifically, what do they need to know? How can they make a decision based on the information and knowledge you have? And how does that serve the needs of the business, right? How does this serve the needs of the business that you are trying to apply for? So the second point I would make is just the, the, the translation is not how do I get an MBA, but it's how do I take the skill set and the knowledge that I have and apply it to what company X is doing. And to do that, you need to really understand what the company does. You need to understand its business model. You need to understand its products and services. You need to understand how the company makes money. You know, that's the, the number one sort of um, analytical question is if you're applying for a job at a business, how does that company make money? Who are their customers? How do those customers make decisions? And then within that, how does sustainability provide a competitive advantage for that business? So that's the second point I would make. And the third point I would make is for people who have graduate degrees, I notice this all the time in my career, which is that if, you, if I can just be honest, um, sometimes people get a little complacent because they have a master's degree or a PhD. Because you can always fall back on, oh, well, I have a PhD in this subject. Oh, I have a master's degree on this subject. Folks, let me, let me just tell you a, a little bit about the real world as I see it. This topic is moving so quickly. 
it's moving so fast. There's so many actors in it that a master's degree from five years ago means absolutely nothing in terms of um, um, your value today unless you have used your master's degree or your undergraduate degree for what it should be, which is it gives you the base knowledge and the level of curiosity that you need so that you can remain at the cutting edge of a subject. You need to be at the sharpest ed edge of a subject because there needs to be some value that you provide that nobody else inside that company can provide. And so what I would just say to folks who might be a few years out of school, or if you're in school, let me just tell you, it's a very, very exciting place to be in, but it, i.e. this whole sustainability, climate, et cetera, in the business world, but it is a space where a lot of people are coming into and don't rest on your laurels. Um, always remain very, very sharp, stay up to date on the newest technologies, the newest policies, the newest regulations, um, because if it's not you, somebody else will, and your master's degree, you know, on your resume will not be the reason why you will win out uh, 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 compared to somebody else um, in the job market today. So those are just some, some, you know, practical pieces of advice for folks who want to come into the business world. I would not worry about getting an MBA. Um, in fact, I, I would say that would be a bit of a detriment. Um, you have the, you have the qualifications. Um, it's about how do you translate that into what's useful for a company. And for that, it starts by really understanding the companies that you are interested in and that are looking to hire um, in this space. Thank you. Um, Anika, I'm, I'm wondering about um, what have you, for example, in all your work experiences, what has been the biggest surprise in terms of what you do and the SDGs? Have you had any pushback? I mean, it's business, yeah. so they want the bottom line, they want money. But what has been the surprising yeah. pushback that, you know? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, seven years ago, um, seven, eight years ago, oh, let me just start again. We're in a very different moment now than when the SDGs came about. At some level, you don't really need, I would argue you don't really need the SDGs anymore. Um, the SDGs were a very, very helpful um, awareness builder around sustainability and sustainable development. Um, they were, they, you know, they helped in a simple way, in a colorful way, they captured people's minds, they captured people's imaginations, there was so much excitement around it and so on and so forth. That excitement has died down around the SDGs in the business world. I don't hear about the SDGs, you know, the way I did four or five years ago. Four or five years ago, businesses and investors said, oh, I want to align my investments with the SDGs and so on. Now, no one really talks, or much fewer people talk about it. But that's not a mark of the failure of the SDGs. That's a mark of the success, I would say, because the underlying things that the SDGs were driving for are now actually just become part of how businesses are planning their strategy. They're asking themselves, how do I become more efficient in my business? How do I use less energy? Not because necessarily it's something that um, um, I want to do, but it's because it's something that it brings down the cost and it increases the profits of my firm. Or, hey, my investors are pushing me to do it. So, you know, and if the investors are the ones who own the company, so therefore I'm doing it as well. So the SDGs, again, you know, there are those who sort of view the SDGs religiously and they say, we need to use the SDGs and then really look at the 169 targets and the indicators and blah, blah, blah. I've never been, I've never subscribed to that. Even though colleagues of ours at the SDSN, that's, you know, that's what they do. And I respect them for it. As again, the pragmatist in me says, the SDGs were saying to people, we need to, in a way, we need to decrease emissions. We need to increase fairness. We need to decrease inequality and so on and so forth. Those are the simple takeaways of it. And now it's about how do you actually get that done? And that's where 
you know, that's where the world is today. As evidence of this, I'll tell you that look at the U.S. government. Last week, they announced $370 billion in climate investments. No one, they've never done anything like that before. Is it enough? No. Is it perfect? No. Are there many shortcomings with it? Yes. But the message has, has been received by the U.S. government that, you know, the world cares about climate. Uh, similarly, for me in the business world, you know, there's a trillion dollar green bond market right now, a trillion dollars of green bonds that are out there. You don't need to tell investors, hey, did you know climate change matters? Did you know you should invest in green stuff? They get it. Now they're actually looking for, well, what are the best investments? Hey, Anika, should I invest in solar or should I invest in wind? What do you think about hydrogen? What's your view about carbon capture and sequestration? How do we think about resilience? You know, they're very practical micro questions. Um, you know, I had a client today say to me, hey, Anik, and I'm meeting with the CEO of Nestle in a few weeks. What are the three questions I should ask him about the future of food? I mean, these are very practical questions that are on folks' mind. And I think that's where, um, um, if there's one takeaway I, I would have if I was listening to me, it would be be pragmatic um, and make and translate your knowledge into practical things that companies and investors can actually action, then you will find your skill set to be very much in demand. Thank you. Wow. Oh, honey, that's so interesting. I mean, I really thank you so much. I, I have an, sort of the, the, the questions will be coming from the audience. So please, audience, uh, put your questions in the Q&A. But I do have a question for you, Anika, another one. Um, OK, so your message is, you know, getting a master's or even if you have a doctorate in this field, that's not the way to go. You just need to stay on top of the latest information in this field of the SDGs. But for those of us who do have a doctorate or a master's or even an undergraduate degree and they want and we want more study outside. I mean, what have you done to continue growing? Yeah. Is it just read, read, read the newspapers? Are there specific newspapers that yeah. you read or sure. trade magazines? What sure. do you do? Yeah, good question. So, so just to be clear, I'm not saying to anyone, I will never say to someone you shouldn't go to graduate school or you shouldn't go to undergrad. I mean, I, I, uh, I respect that. I teach myself. I did my PhD. I, you know, it's been a big part of my life. And I, all I'll say, just so it's very clear, my point there is don't rest on your laurels. Just because you have a PhD, just because you have a master's doesn't give you claim to this topic or to this subject or to jobs or to interesting opportunities because there is a huge amount of competition now because lots of people are entering this space. Um, a lot of people will have those degrees. A lot of people will be working in this space. A lot of people won't have the deg degrees but will have worked in solar or in wind or in re regenerative ag or in this or that. And they'll say, great, you have your master's from six years ago, but I've been, I'm doing this stuff today. Um, and so just so I'm, it's very clear, Lucia, I'm now never against graduate school. If you are, if the whole point about graduate school to me and what I tell my students at SIPA is you have to use this as a way to become obsessed with subjects and then read about them and study them for the rest of your life. Um, um, that is the whole point of going to school to me because otherwise you can't really learn that much in two years. It, it gives you the seeds of what you will learn over the next 60. So that's on that point. Now, it, to the very practical point about what you should read and so on and so forth. So again, may, being hyper practical. Number one, everyone should read the Financial Times. If you're interested in business and finance and so on, the FT is required reading um, for me and for my team here at Jeffries. I run a team of 10. Um, professionals on sustainable finance. They have done the best reporting and the best work around climate and sustainability in the financial and business world. Um, the FT is expensive, I know. Um, so, it, you know, not everyone can afford it, but if you can afford it, I highly recommend um, reading the Financial Times on a regular basis. The second thing I would, I would recommend everyone reading if you have a particular interest in business is Bloomberg. Um, it's also not cheap. It's $30 a month. 
but the, the journalism that they're doing on Bloomberg Green around climate and sustainability is excellent. And it, this is the stuff that people in, in the business world read. They read the Financial Times and they read Bloomberg. So I would, I would say those two from a, on a day-to-day -day basis, you should be um, in, in that um, uh, realm. The second thing I would say is in terms of books, you should frankly just keep reading books, um, just hopefully like you did in your master's program. Although I learned as it, now I teach at SIPA for the last couple of years that many of my students didn't even read um, <laughs> when they were in my classes, which was always a little bit, a little heartbreaking, but um, there is just so much good nonfiction and fiction right now writ being written about climate and sustainability. Um, you know, some of my favorite writers include Vaslav Shmil, S-M-I-L, on the energy transition, um, who's a great scientist and historian um, of energy. Um, you know, I've read a lot of work in the um, natural, I mean, there's just, there's just so much. I, every day there's more books being written around climate on the cutting edge of hydrogen or on the future of regenerative agriculture or, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the third thing I would say to folks is that, you know, you should uh, uh, listen to podcasts. Um, there are so many great podcasts around sustainability um, that, uh, that folks listen to. Um, I have uh, really enjoyed uh, Michael Liebreich L-I-E-B-R-I-C-H, Michael Liebreich, um, his work um, on uh, uh, his podcast. Um, there's also David Roberts' podcast. He now has a substack called Volts. He's one of the best journalists in the world on climate and sustainability. Um, highly recommend uh, those two folks um, specifically. So yeah, it, it is, you know, th there is no answer other than staying knowledgeable and, be, and frankly, be, being obsessed with something. It would be the other thing, uh, sort of piece of advice I would have to folks in the audience that n people can't become experts in all parts of sustainability or sustainable development, but there should be one part of it that you are obsessed with, that you know more about than anyone else. You know, all the players, you know, all the companies, you know, all the regulation and so on and so forth. And it's really, you just need to know one part of it, whether it's hydrogen or, you know, a cloud seeding or geoengineering or whatever that might be, but become really, really expert on it. Um, I'll also suggest to people on the line that there's a difference between knowing the name of something and knowing the topic. Um, it's something I, I find that, you know, just because you know the name of a topic or you know the name of something doesn't mean you know anything about the underlying subject. So don't live in generalities. Um, live with, you know, live in the world of specific information and specific knowledge. Um, that's what's going to make, that's how you make the translation from being a, a student and maybe being, you know, someone who can write research papers at a think tank to being useful in the business world. It's to have practical knowledge um, about something specific. Okay. Thank you so much. So, Anika, we do have some questions here. Here's one from, I believe this is Faith Clark. And her question is, what are your thoughts about some states investing or not investing their pension funds with companies who do not have sustainable practices? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question and something you're reading in the, in the papers today a lot. The whole ESG space has become mired in controversy right now in the United States because it has entered the realm of politics. Um, and in some ways, um, it was always going to go here and it always has been here, but right now it's become more, it's become louder than it uh, used to be. I'll just say a couple things about this. Um, the first is that if you view sustainability as a way for a company to make higher revenues or lower costs, in other words, to increase their profits, um, then there's no question that 
sustainability considerations or that sustainable companies should be inside uh, a pension fund's um, invest investment, right? If, 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 if the goal of sustainability is to improve and increase a company's long-term earnings, then there's no issue here. If you are viewing sustainability as through the lens of um, this will lower the, eco the financial returns of a business and or this will lower the financial returns that I as an investor get, um, then you will be in, 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 in issues. Because the role of a fiduciary in the United States as legally defined is that you have a duty of loyalty and a duty of care to your um, investor, to the person whose money you are investing. And so if you are managing money on behalf of a pensioner with the intention that this will lead to lower returns, then you're going to have some real issues and they're going to be lawsuits. And you're going to have, you know, the stuff that's happening in Florida and in Texas right now. So to answer their question, the main response is it depends on how you define the project. And for me, and for what we do at Jeffries, I'll just be crystal clear. Sustainability is about increasing the profits of a company. It's about lowering their risk or increasing your revenues. It's about making your customers <clears throat> more loyal to you. It's about being aligned with regulation. You know, there's so many tailwinds right now where you can make the argument that being a sustainable company is actually going to make you more profitable in the long run. Customers care about it. The regulators care about it. Your investors care about it and so on and so forth. But for people who look at sustainability in the business world as I'm doing this because I want to make the world a better place, regardless of the financial returns and the impact of financial returns, then you're going to be your, your, I'm not saying that's good or bad. That's a different project. And that's going to, you're going to come up against some of these issues um, um, like you're seeing play themselves out right now. Those are my, that's my take on that question. Okay, here's another question from a Kennedy Miru, and um, they ask, do you have some general insights around social enterprises that make money while doing good for the community? Do you have some specific pointers to investors, funders that might be interested in supporting such enterprises, especially if those enterprises are based in East Africa? And mm -hmm. Aniket, I did have a question about, can you please repeat the name of, you, you mentioned two po podcasts. One is Michael Libroch and the other one is David yep. Roberts. So is yep. it Roberts or how do you spell Roberts. that Roberts? Yeah, David Roberts and, it, and the name of his uh, podcast is called Volts, V-O-L-T-S. Okay. Okay. Um, Social Enterprise East Africa Investors, okay. The... Most important question when you're starting a company or investing in a company is number one, what problem are you solving for? Okay, so what, why are you creating a new business? What, what are you trying to do that nobody else is doing right now? And number two, what's your business model? You know, this is the world of business. You, you need to make money so that you can sustain yourself so that you can return money to your shareholders, that you can pay your employees, you can build the products that you wanna sell and so on and so forth. So that's the logic of a business, right? Whether you like it or not, that's how business works. It's what problem are you solving for? And then what's your business model of actually making that succeed? That's true anywhere in the world. That's true in East Africa, that's true here in New York and so on and so forth. When you're in East Africa, the challenge is that foreign investors will think that operating in East Africa is much more risky than it actually is in practice. And so in, in financial terms, the point is that they will actually increase the profit expectations that are required 
for them to invest in your business because they'll say, okay, that's great that you're trying to build this uh, company, but hey, this is very risky and therefore I demand a higher return, meaning I need a higher amount of profits or I need a higher return of the profits um, to me as an investor. That's if the investment is purely from a financial perspective. There will be other investors who will say, you know what, I'm okay having a lower return because I'm not doing this just to maximize returns. I'm actually looking for some type of financial return and social return, right? So that's the other point. In, there are generally, the other point I should just make, just as taking a step back is, when you work in the world of finance and business, you realize there are very few general generalities, okay? There's nuance with everything. There isn't one invest, one type of investor. There isn't one type of regulation. There are some investors in the world who will say, I'm, I'll take a lower financial return, but then I'm not a financial investor. I'm an impact investor. You know, there are all, it, there, everything depends on context and it depends on who you are engaging with. Um, but I think the way that for whoever asked the question, the real, you know, the, 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 the point to answer is what problem are you trying to solve for? And then what's your model of how you make money? And if you can develop those things clearly, you will find investors who will want to support your business. And then you, and then you go from there. Um, and, and I'm happy to go into a, a more specifics if, if the person wants to talk, but um, that those are just some high level thoughts. Okay, thank you. Um, the same person asks, um, based on your experiences, uh, he's or she's curious to know which sectors attract most funding investment, and your your take on why. Yeah, so right now we are we are seeing just a real explosion of financing for all things in the sustainability world. The two areas that are getting most focus right now are renewable energy, so solar, wind, solar and wind specifically. Um, I would like to see more investment in, in hydro and in nuclear. Um, I've always been supportive of nuclear, and I think it, it, we need more capital going into it, but it, it's tough these days. Um, so, there's, so that's one area is renewable energy. And the other area is um, electric vehicles um, and electric uh, transportation, where, as I'm sure folks saw recently, you have uh, the state of California, probably the fifth largest economy in the world, saying that after 2035, there will be no new internal combustion engine cars being sold. You know, signals like this are, are basically driving the, the auto companies to go all electric um, over the next 15 years, which is just an incredible thing because if that were to actually happen, you know, there needs to be an entire infrastructure built for that in charging stations, uh, uh, improvement of grid, of transmissions, you know, all of that kind of stuff needs to evolve. And so um, um, that's the second area that there is a lot of, um, 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 where there is a lot of focus. The reality is, is that over the next 20, 30 years, every part of the business, uh, every part of the economy will have a sustainability angle to it. You know, all of our buildings in some way need to be um, refitted um, to be sure that they are more climate um, aligned. Um, you're going to see a major um, um, focus around heat pumps in the homes so that our heating and cooling becomes driven by electricity and not by gas. Um, you're going to see uh, a, a major investments in transportation, whether it's EVs, electric scooters, electric buses, electric trucks, electric, uh, um, um, at some level, at some point, low carbon um, um, uh, flight. So there's just almost a limitless amount of investments. Each one of these sectors are in a different place in terms of investability right now. Um, but those, those are just some, some, some uh, uh, thoughts to that question. Thank you so much. Here's a more general question, um, Aniket. It says, um, but by Jessica Irene, um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic that causes us less focus on SDGs, what do you think we should focus on to be able to achieve the SDG by 
2030. So this could be, you can focus yeah. on one thing or just in general. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think the most important thing to focus on to achieve the SDGs is public policy. It's, it's actually, um, it's government. It's what are the rules of the game that are being established by governments? What are the incentives that they're putting in place? Um, because business will follow. It's honestly, that's my experience. I don't, you know, not, this is not the high theory of academia. This is just my life experience of actually doing this stuff is that when the incentives change and the incentives change because in large part, because governments change the rules of the game, business reacts like that. Business doesn't actually like oil, gas, and coal. We don't actually have like, it's not like we love fossil fuels and we hate renewables. If the returns on renewables are higher than the returns on fossil fuels in a risk on a risk adjusted basis, investors will move to that. Um, I, you know, I really do believe that in general, business is not immoral. It's amoral. It doesn't have a moral um, driver. It basically just says, where do I make the highest returns for a given level of risk? Um, and, and so, and I think that is being driven in large part and will be driven in large part over the next 50 years by policy, uh, by government. Um, and so that's what I would be focusing on. I would be focusing on if you're an American saying, what are the things that the federal, state and local governments need to do in practical terms? You know, don't come to me and say, oh, we need a long term, blah, 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 50 year, 100 year. This. That's ridiculous. People get that. What do I need to do now? Um, okay, and again, I, we need to put a price on carbon. Okay, do we do it at the federal level? Do we do it at the state level? Do we do it at the local level? Oh, do we do it as a direct tax or do we set up carbon markets? If we set up carbon markets at what level, at what price, what sector should be included? Those are the level of specific knowledge and insight that the best people, that the Forget about the best people. That's what the world needs right now is answers to very specific questions around sustainability. And that's where I, I think the focus needs to be. And then if it's about achieving the SDGs globally, I think the number one issue around, um, and here, you know, Professor Sachs, Jeffrey Sachs has done some of the most important work on this is how do you increase the amount of capital flow from high income countries to low income countries um, over the next 20, 30 years? And for that, that really is about changing the rules of the game. It's about changing how the IMF thinks about um, um, debt sustainability of low income countries. That's about changing how the credit rating agencies think about um, um, uh, credit ratings for low income countries. Um, you know, it, it's not, th those are systemic questions. And that's where I think there's a lot more focus that there needs to be. It's about how do you increase the size of the World Bank by the factor of five? Um, you know, it, those are very practical questions that I think people would be, um, uh, uh, you know, should spend their time working on. Okay. Annika, do you think that we really, are we going to reach the, or achieve the SDGs? Are we going to the SDGs by 2030? Are we going to achieve them and the indicators and all of that? Um, are we going to achieve the SDGs by 2030? No, I don't think we're going to achieve the SDGs by 2030. But that's not a failure of the SDGs. I think you know, the, S the SDGs have started a, a, re a look, we're, in some ways, honestly, I would say to folks, and I know this might be um, sacrilege um, at, SD at a, at a <laughs> event like this, I would say it's not about the SDGs anymore, is my view, um, because the SDGs have kick-started the work. The work is ongoing. The work has begun. We're trying to get, you know... 90% of the world is under a net zero um, um, uh, framing right now, you know, at the company level or at the country level. That Would that have happened without the SDGs and the Paris Agreement? I don't know, but we're here now. Um, you know, 
uh, companies are all now signing up to have science-based targets and to implement them in, with regards to their emissions. Um, company, you know, countries are going are having major, major investment programs around sustainability. Um, you know, th this is now all in motion, and the question now is about acceleration. How do you accelerate this? Um, I don't know if that. My personal view is that you don't accelerate it by saying, hey, did you know that the SDGs were signed on to by 193 governments seven years ago? Like, I don't think that's where the conversation needs to be. I think instead the conversation needs to be, okay, um, you know, 30% of the US electricity today comes from um, uh, renewables. We need to get that to 90% over the next 20 years. How are we gonna get that done? Um, so that, that's, that's more of where my focus is. And I think where more people on the line should focus their time. Thank you. And we have almost the last question. Um, yeah. but you know, you've given us some very good suggestions, recommendations in terms of really focus on the specifics or, you know, uh, or, yeah. um, and instead of just general generalities, continue to grow and learn always. Um, based on your own personal experiences in the workforce and education, is there anything you would have done differently? Ooh, great question. Um, you know, I, I, it's a great question. Um, I think I do a pretty good job of the of living this my life under a what I call the regret minimization framework, where when I think about decisions, I think in 20 years from now, will I have regretted if I didn't do X? Um, and so it's a very important part of the way I think about the world. Um, but at a very, very practical level, my biggest regret, um, and this I would say, um, the starting point of this was when I was in college, and I don't know how old folks are on the line, but um, I, I wish I had not I wish I had not stopped studying mathematics and science um, as early as I did. Um, you know, I was a pretty good math student in high school. I took a couple of math classes at Yale at undergrad, but then I got interested in policy and I got in interested in history and all this. And I, and in some ways that was more compelling to me than staying with um, sort of more technical knowledge or technical training. And I, I don't think it slowed me down, but I think it would have been nice to have remained a student of math and science for a longer period of time. So it, it might not be the type of answer that the question was trying to um, get. In, otherwise, I would just say, you know, this is a great subject. You all were early in, in getting trained in it. It's super exciting. Um, you know, stay committed to it. Um, get get really practical. It's just that's just the one thing I want you to take away. You get practical, and become the very best at one part of sustainability. And don't get caught up in 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 lingo or in rhetoric. Provide practical uh, um, value to people that you work with, and if you do, you're going to have an amazing career in this space because the whole world is being reinvented right now and and it's our, it's 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 just a great project to be in. So, those are just some thoughts and if anyone wants to stay in touch, Lucia has my email address, so please just share that with folks and and happy to. Okay. Um thank you so much, Aniket. Aniket, I know that you're rushing to go. I'll ask you one last question and that's sure. it, promise. Yeah. And this is from Piyush, um, and he says, do you think that world leaders and the governments and the UN, for that matter, are really concerned about achieving the SDGs? So it goes back to that achieving the SDGs question. Also, what magnitude think, yeah. Or of it? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I don't think people wake up in the morning saying, how do I achieve the SDGs? I don't think that's a question that's on most national leaders' minds or business leaders' minds. They ask, but they do ask, how do I make sure that the population of my country lives a decent life? 
I mean, I do, I'm not that cynical. I don't think, I, I, I honestly do believe most people wake up, even if you disagree with people's politics, I do think most people wake up in the morning when you're an elected official and you say, how do I make people's lives better? Um, and, you know, and it's funny because when you are an elected leader, you have to think about trade-offs because the world is, has trade-offs. That's one thing I think the SDG world didn't spend enough time articulating. There are costs, there are trade-offs to the SDGs and sustainable development. You, you know, if you're going to increase wages for everyone, you are going to lower returns for shareholders. That's, I mean, that's logic. There's no, there's no, that's common sense. You increase the costs to a company, you decrease the profits. That might be okay. And maybe we as a society say that's what we want to do. That's fine. But there are trade-offs to the world. And elected leaders know that better than anyone. Do I give a subsidy to this industry or that industry? Do I save this? That, do I save the ag system or do I save the car uh, uh, manufacturer? I mean, these are all very practical questions. So I'm not that harsh on, uh, and, and the other point, by the way, is that politicians will, will respond to what people want. I think that the focus should be on making these topics that we care about, fair wages, uh, climate mitigation, climate adaptation, we have to make them political issues. You have to win, you have to get it to the point where people will vote based on a candidate's views on climate change. We're not there yet. We're not there at all right now. Um, and that's the hard work, I think. And that's really hard work. But by the way, in the US, the one political party has gotten uh, Americans to vote against their best interest for 50 years. It, but it took 50 years, but the Republicans are, were able to convince people to vote against their self-interest, whereas I would argue voting on the SDG lines is in your best interest. If you are a low-income, middle-income person, if you're not a gazillionaire, then, this, then actually the SDGs make total sense. You should tax people more. You should have more redistribution. You should have higher wages. You should decrease emissions, like all this kind of stuff. But we in the SDG world, you know, we live in this sort of like ivory tower of 300 page reports and, you know, conferences where we only talk to one another and blah, blah, blah. Go out, just, you know, take these ideas and figure out how do you can, how do you convince the masses, but also how do you actually translate this into specific policies that candidates can run on? Then you start making this really real. Um, and then you can see that one day you'll have a $369 billion climate thing. And by the way, if there were more Democratic senators in the House and the Senate, I mean, more Democratic senators in the Senate and more folks in the House, then it could have been a $500 billion climate package or a trillion dollar climate package. But that, those, those things are because of politics in the U.S. And so I would just say to folks, you know, don't have generalities like, oh, politicians are bad or good or business is bad or good. You got to get in the fight. You got to be in there. You got to be in the system um, and bring your knowledge to that. And then you'll actually get to see what it's like to try to push some of these changes in the real world. Thank you so much, Dr. Shaw. Um, really appreciate your time with us this afternoon. Uh, very, very enlightening and very powerful, I think. And also as well to Dr. Shoemaker, uh, really, you know, both of you, uh, you've been fabulous and it's been a great way to kick off the speaker series. Uh, thank you. And thanks everybody for participating and being here with us. I've The emails of both speakers um, I've included in the chat. So please follow up with them um, with any questions you may have or just email me if you didn't receive it. Again, thank you. Good luck, Anika. Really, really love hearing you nice and Dr. You. Shoemaker. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone.